Welcome back to the Truffle Forager podcast with your host, Ben Sweet. That's me. On this show, we dive deep into the enchanting world of truffles. From truffle cultivation, the truffle latest science and research, to training your dog how to hunt truffles, um, to mushroom foraging, and also to that deeper connection to nature for your own mental health and well-being. If you're new here and you're new to truffle dog and truffle dog training, then I encourage you to go and check out my website where I've got a free truffle dog training beginner's guide, which we can download just by entering in your name and email address. Just head over to truffleforager.com and you'll be able to get that and also join my uh, my weekly newsletter where I'll be sending out tips, uh, stories, um, content updates and things like that. So yeah, head on over to truffleforager.com if you'd like that free guide and I'll see you there. And also, just before we dive into this episode, um, if you do like this sort of content, I'd really appreciate you to do all that good stuff, that liking, the following, subscribing. Uh, But I think most importantly, if you can just share this with, um, you know, another friend who might find this sort of content interesting, I'd be really, really grateful as it really helps grow the show. So without further ado, on to today's episode guest, uh, and that is Nick Enger, a UK-based, Bristol-based uh, dog trainer. He's been on TV shows, he's been uh, highly acclaimed for what he does, and he's been a dog trainer since the age of about 15 or 16, I think, properly. So on this episode, we dive into all sorts of things with regards to dog training, uh, but quite interestingly, though, uh, Nick's recently got himself a new dog, and he expressed an interest himself in learning how to do truffle hunting. So he actually came across my podcast as well. And so we had that sort of uh, thing in common. He's also the host of his own popular uh, dog training podcast called Dog Talk with Nick Benger, where he interviews a lot of um, top, top dog training experts as well. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Uh, We go all over the place, um, but it's a really interesting one if you're interested in dogs, in truffle hunting, and just generally how to get the most out of your dog when it comes to dog training. So without further ado, enjoy this episode. So hi, hi Nick. Uh, Welcome to uh, the Truffle Forager podcast. Appreciate you for being here. Thanks for having me, Ben. It's really good to be on your podcast because... I've been a po- I've been a fan of your podcast for a while now, so it was really cool to connect with you. One of the few, I'm sure. Like, like I don't I, I don't hear that too often, so it's always a bit surreal, to be honest. It's happened once or twice, um, but yeah, no, I appreciate it. I'm glad someone's getting some value from this truffle malarkey. Um, but yeah, for those of you who don't know, I, th- I think well, I'm not sure if you you know this, Nick, but I came across you. I know you're quite big in the dog training space and you're doing quite a lot online and you know it's commendable um, but I came across you because uh, I think I was st- my social medias were getting crowned with adverts from Ivan um, I forget I can't pronounce his surname but Ivan the the you know arguably world renowned dog trainer uh, mm-hmm. multiple world champion of XYZ sport thing which I'm sure we can touch on but then I googled him and then your podcast with him came up so then that then I was tuned on to you and you've got a you've got a great podcast um called dog talk with nick benger so yeah that's how we dove deep and uh you know i reached out just to sort of like you know just try and connect and uh, see if i can learn from you and then and then yeah we ended up going to a scent work class um together the other week but uh so yeah it's been great to connect with you um and and yeah i guess it, obviously i want to jump into go on go on go on sorry it was surreal for me when I saw your name pop up in my inbox because it was just strange timing after I had literally been binging your podcasts because for the last few years, I've kind of played with the idea of doing truffle hunting. Um, I, I got my first working line dog about a year ago. And before that, it wasn't something I didn't really have a, like a suitable dog. Um, but yeah, I got this. I got my first working line dog about a year ago. And then, I don't know, it's just always been on the back of my mind. You know, it's always just been something that I've never really taken action on, but I was kind of curious about. Um, And so every now and then I would go into a rabbit hole of researching it. And that time I had discovered your podcast, started listening to that a lot. Um, And then I had an email from you. So it was really strange, (laughs) just strange, like coincidental timing. Yeah, nice. Well, I'm I'm glad. Um, It's it's amazing how the world works sometimes. I mean, let's just jump into into that then straight away. Like, um, so you you got your dog. I know her name is Onyx, and uh, so what? 
how did you because obviously you're a pet dog trainer primarily right so i'm you know i've heard you say that that's how you describe yourself a few times how how and what has the journey been like um you know maybe we touch on the early days in a bit but what what has led you from get, getting into pet dog training and focusing on that probably for you know years right and then what's the transition between you now getting more interested in you know scent stuff specifically because i know through the people that you've been interviewing you know you're obviously very you know you've done a ton more research than i have in this space so you know it's going to be amazing to pick your brain about you know what you've learned from all those gurus arguably um, but what what was it that got you into it in the first place um i knew i wanted to there was a lot of there's a lot of stuff i've kind of dabbled in over the years you know um there's a sport called igp which is kind of comes from like a, a police training roots you know so you have the protection element but you also have obedience um, and you have tracking uh, following the scent of people. And that was something that I dabbled in um, a little bit. And every time I dabbled in it, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so that was on my mind. And then you're right, at when the you same say dabbled, time. Do you mean, yep. Sorry, when you say dabbled, do you mean like mm -hmm. just dabbled researching or dabbled researching and like doing with your dog? Uh, both, both. Um, yeah. I didn't have a, cool. my, pre my previous dog was a Labrador. Um, so he's not really, you know, he's, he's not going to be that kind of dog. Um, but, um, so, uh, I had, I'd, it was both, it was researching it. And then also I'd had a, I have a, like friends that are involved in it. So I'd had a few goes, you know, uh, with other people's dogs doing some training and whatnot. And it was just so much fun that I knew it was something that I'd like to get involved in. But then at the same time, you're right. I was also really heavily into, uh, scent training. I get, that would I, I would say well maybe so i would say I, I probably that was more researching however having said that i knew how to teach scent work i was teaching scent work classes and stuff like that mm. but i just mean on like a higher level um mm. you know we spoke about it a little bit before ben like more of like an operational level it was something that i was like going to webinars on and stuff like that but i um i didn't have a working line dog i didn't have a dog that had energy to work for long periods of time with extreme like high intensity and that's what i knew i wanted um so i went down a bit of a research rabbit hole and ended up getting onyx and actually on my social media over the last year since i've had a i've been documenting that whole process a lot because it's my first like truthfully it's my first working line dog um although that's not to say i haven't worked a lot with other people's dogs like as a pet dog yeah. trainer for the last like almost 15 years, I've worked with pretty much every dog you can think of, but I didn't have, didn't have one myself at home. We had, at the time we have three dogs, like I said, my Labrador, I uh, had a little, I have a little uh, terrier mix and a little Chihuahua cross pug. And um, none of them were like super high drive dogs, you know, my Labrador was like, yeah, so I was, I love that dog so much, you know, like I was my first dog, it was like a really special dog for me. And I taught him so much because I was really into training, but more like tricks and stuff like that. Uh, he wasn't really, he wasn't made for it, you know. He 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 enjoyed it, but he was never gonna do it at like a really high level, you know. Yeah, and you, what you touched on there, and obviously I'm a little bit more aware now. But I tell you what, when I first got Buddy, you know, even though I've grown up with dogs, I don't think I fully appreciated. You know, when people say working line dog, you know, can you just share like what that is and what that means? And and also, I guess, because I think a lot of even though I've got a few friends, you know, they're very quick to tell me, oh, it's a working dog. It's a working dog. But, you know, it, and they're not, you know, getting a working dog to work the dogs type of thing. But it's almost like a stab of honor, a, a badge of honor. But what what really is the difference between a working dog and a non-working dog? Uh, and what should, I guess, people, because there's going to be people listening to this podcast who, you know, keen to go truffle hunting with their dogs and, and maybe they don't have a dog yet. Um, so maybe you can just speak to that. Yeah, I, it's a really good point, Ben, because this comes up a lot, even in like our puppy classes and stuff like that, where I think probably the majority of people that aren't really involved in dogs don't realize that there is a massive difference between what we call lines in dogs, you know, um, 
So really, you could split it into three lines. You have working line dogs, which come from a, ba a working background, you know, so I like the parents were involved in working in some way. So usually when it comes to truffle dogs, we're talk it's primarily gun dogs that we're talking about, you know, so mm -hmm. maybe they have uh, parents that are involved in, in gun dog training, or sometimes they might be involved in another activity, like some other form of scent detection or, you know, so, some, but they have like a working background, essentially. Then you have show lines which is what you might think of as like crufts, you know, running around the ring. And basically those dogs are much more, it's much more about the aesthetics and having a, like a pretty dog. Um, but there's no selection pressure. Like no one is breeding those dogs to have working mm -hmm. ability. So generally you're not going to have a lot of working ability because no one's really paying attention to that. And of course you're, you're going to have exceptions. Um, but, but overwhelmingly that's going to be the case. And then you have pet line dogs, which, um i just you know um people have just bred their pet dogs together um then there's not really any like selection pressure for anything especially um you know it's just it's just uh, a random pairing essentially of people's pet dogs but but in terms of like working ability you really if you want a dog that is going to be able to work for long periods of time at high intensity you want to get a working line dog. However, if you want a dog that's going to curl up by the fire and be the easiest dog ever, maybe you don't want a working dog, you know, because mm. a working dog wants work, you know, wants to be doing stuff. Um, so oftentimes they're not actually the easiest pet dogs, but they're, they're certainly going to be the best working dogs. Um, not to say that oh, a good working dog can't be a good pet dog, but they just have higher requirements in terms of they, they really want to be doing something. Like there's a there's a saying in dog training if you don't give the dog a job they'll go self-employed you know so a lot of dogs for example especially when we're talking about working dogs you know like border collies are a good example if you don't give like a working border collie a job they're going to want to chase cars they're going to want to herd children in the park because they have that like yearning to do something uh with their with all of that kind of herding instinct so that's something that you have to be really aware of when you're getting a working line dog. However, if you're going to get a dog to go out and be a, a truffle hunting dog, then certainly you're going to be looking at dogs with a working background in order to have the mm. highest likelihood of success. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that. Can, can you just speak to like, I've heard this a while ago and, but I just think it'd be a really nice bit of like question answered on this podcast, you know, obviously different breeds, need different payoffs with regards to feeding that working mentality and like essentially draining their energy. You know, you've got, um, as you just mentioned, the collies need to sort of herd. Can you sort of just take us through the main categories of like those types of different dog breeds and therefore like what is one or two things you can do with each one um, to, I guess, I mean, what, what am I looking for there to, to not make them a neurotic dog that's going to drive you up the ball to to give them that release that they're looking for because obviously you know depending on the breed they're going to want a different type of release um do you know what i'm trying to say mm. yeah totally i think you know we we on a podcast we have to talk quite generally so you know some mm. people might say like uh you know you might have a labrador that doesn't like retrieving you know but we have to do but just we, you know we're talking quite generally here obviously individuals are individuals um, but when, when you have gun dog breeds, I mean, you really, the, I mean, this could, this could take a long time, Ben, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you have like the retrievers, right. Which, uh, you know, are bred to retrieve. So, so retrieving games usually are going to be something that they really enjoy. Um, also with like, I also think sometimes with retrievers, they have quite a high tolerance for like, um, they just quite like training. You know, and, and they can be quite, um, they quite like, like routine, you know, uh, versus if you have like, when you talk more about Spaniels, you have a lot of drive to hunt, which is what has made them so popular for as like scent detection dogs, you know, because you have a dog that really, you know, is an active dog that really wants to, to be doing stuff. Um, you know, I always think of them as like, they're quite ADHD that like, they always kind of have the ants in their pants. They just want to be on the move. They want to be doing stuff. And a lot of that comes because in the in the gun dog training, part of their job is to flush birds. So you want them running through mm. like nettles and all that kind of stuff. 
to flush the birds up so people can shoot them. So you want quite an active dog versus the Labrador doesn't really, you know, Labradors aren't really used for flushing like that. Um, but I think scent detection is a really good outlet for, for Spaniels. I mean, when we run scent detection classes, I always feel it's oftentimes unfair. You know, we'll have like a, just an assortment of different breeds and then someone will bring along like a, a working cock Spaniel. Not that they're using for anything, but it has that instinct. And it always just, I, I almost like have to try and assure the other people. It's like, no, no, it's, it's normal because their dog just gets it so quickly. It's so like mm -hmm. natural for them. Um, so I think that can be a, a really good outlet for them. However, with Spaniels, unlike the Retrievers, don't tend to have the same tolerance for like, or same, like the Spaniels tend to struggle more with self-control, you know, where it's like, if you ask a, a Cocker Spaniel to sit still <laughs> be, and like a stay training is like a really hard thing. Like for a Labrador, a Labrador stay training is not particularly problematic. For a Cocker Spaniel, stay training is almost like a punishment. You know, it's like, I really don't want to sit still. I just want to be running all the time. Mm. And there are like smart ways you can go about working with that personality type, if you want to call it that. Um, I always recommend Jane Arden's book, Mission Control to People, which is all about training Cock Spaniels, because I think there are little intricacies or little, just slight changes in approach, which can be quite helpful for for the cocker spaniel mind you know mm. um so that's gun dogs i mean when you start talking about uh i mean it depends what group you want to go into here ben really um obviously maybe don't go into all of the dogs. groups because you know maybe we will be here for like okay. hours but okay. like i guess maybe maybe <laughs> maybe one or two more that are like like very common pet dog groups that fall into two two or three different ones yeah, well, let's talk about herding dogs because we spoke about collies yeah. a little bit. And actually, the interesting thing about collies is traditionally you don't think about them being involved in scent detection. But actually, mm. over the last maybe 10, 15 years, they have actually become more and more popular for that, even though there was there was never really a selection for that historically. Um, there are many people I, that are using them I was them really now. impressed in with the collie that we saw on that workshop just the other weekend, you yeah. know, um, just in terms of this, like, compared to the other dogs, the Collie was arguably the most systematic searcher there. And whether that was through training or whether yeah. a lot of that was like breed or whether that was just the dog, uh, you know, I was just very yeah. impressed. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, like I said that Spaniels are a bit ADHD. What you might say about Collies is that um, a little bit, uh, what's, what's the word? Um, obsessive, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the acronym now. They're a bit like OCD. That's what I feel. OCD, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, colleagues go for OCD, you know, where it's like everything has to be done in this exact order, you know? Um, yeah. So, you know, again, you know, they have their breed quirks. Um, but with Border Collies, you end up, or you, you really want to be looking at herding games um, are really, really helpful. It's what's actually a, what's kind a good of example like of still a herding really game? Neat. Sorry, what's a good yeah, example of Yeah, this is the herding. problem. It's still still super niche right now um so a lot of people with collies will end up doing agility fly ball um stuff like that but it doesn't a hundred percent really satisfy the herding instinct there are people that have tried to create games so in i think it's i can't remember what country is big in it might be america they have a, a really niche sport called tribal in the uk uh, there's a lady called Kay lawrence that's created a game called sheep balls and basically, it's this idea of herding, um, herding bulls, essentially, right? So you're trying to teach the dog that you're trying to exercise the same, like, training components, but on something that isn't sheep, you know? Um, so there mm -hmm. are people that have tried to kind of create uh, outlets for, for collies, um, but it's still quite niche at the moment, sadly. So people end up doing a lot of other stuff, like agility, fly ball, etc., Nice. Shall, shall I keep and going, Ben? Just to do, do one more. Or you want to? <laughs> okay. Let's do shepherds. Yeah. Let's talk about. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about shepherds. Shepherds are an interesting one because I think it depends. Like, I think the lines are more important with shepherds than maybe some of the other dogs. Because mm. um, if you have a dog, like a shepherd from working lines, usually the working lines is going to be some kind of what we would call bite sport. There's loads of different bite sports. So I've already mentioned IGP. When we say bite sports, mm. we're talking about sports that involve some kind of protection component, right? Um, yeah. So usually when you breed those dogs, 
you breed them to find uh, like tug of war heavily reinforcing, right? Because essentially the protection all comes out of that that tug of war that gets transitioned to like one of those big arm sleeves, uh, which is, you know, like that protect, protective sleeve, or sometimes you might see people in the protective suit, depending on what sort of uh, sport you're um, playing. Um, so generally with, with shepherds, it's going to come a lot more through tug. We should talk a bit about tug, Ben, because a lot of people worry about that. You know, they worry if I start teaching my dog to tug, yeah. are they going to become aggressive? Um, especially since we're talking about protection and that's not the case whatsoever. Um, in fact, it gives you a really good foundation if you if you can um, play tug with a dog, but add in rules. You know, you have to let go when I say to let go. Um, you know, you can't take it until I say take it or, or whatever. But adding some rules and structure is actually a really, really good thing to do with any dog, but especially mm. a shepherd. Um, and don't worry, it's not going to turn into aggression um, if you play tug with your dog. That's a little bit of a an old wives' tale. When people use it for protection sports and stuff like that, um, generally the majority of people doing protection sports don't have aggressive dogs. It's nothing like that. It's, it's a game that the dog's playing um, with the sleeve or the suit or, or whatever. And when you're talking more about police training where they actually have to transition the dog to not attacking the, the sleeve or the suit, but actually attacking the person, that's something that's done very deliberately. Um, you know, there's a whole process for that. It's not something that you're going to do accidentally with a tug toy at home. It, it, those two things are like mm. worlds apart, really. Well, I, I'm tempted to go down that rabbit hole, but I want to step back a second. Mm. And um, well, what I was going to ask you is, I know you said you've been doing your um, scent classes, pet stuff, right? Which I imagine is, is really cool and, and arguably maybe starts out really basic. But I know because you've been you've been on probably a from what I gather you've been on a recent drive with like learning from with regards to scent detection from I guess the best of the best that you, you know you can find and and what has what have you learned since well how would you what would you change in your puppy pet scent classes now given what you'd now know from the recent learnings of diving deep in this subject like what what and I guess maybe start like big picture like fundamental what would you what would you do differently or or not? I like mean, mm -hmm. you were doing it bang out the park, like, you know, since day one. No, no, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. I mean, to be honest, we pitch it to a different, with a little bit of a different yeah. audience with the pet center work classes, because it's kind of more of what you said earlier, which is more, more people that just want to give an outlet to the dog. They're not trying to yeah. uh, do anything in a working sense or like go to a really high level. Find truffles. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. If I was, in terms of more um, starting to build the foundations for um, for actual work, I think mm. generally with a young dog, um, drive is really important, what we call drive in, in dog training, which you might think of as like the motivation to want to do stuff um, or the motivation for the reinforcers that we control, uh, which is primarily food and play. Um, mm. So most... Um, most working dog people, when you are are like assessing the the capability of a dog, you want to see high high drive, high desire to earn the things that we we can control, and those are like skills that you can build up in a young dog. Um, so, for example, you know, let's say you have have a a young dog, you can use something like a flirt pole. So, a flirt pole is you, you can actually find them really easily online, although. Mm. Um, I've actually homemade mine just using a broom and then connecting some st string to it um, and then tying a toy to the end. So a lot of people, when they see a flirt pole, they're reminded of like the toy you play with cats with. It's kind of like that. It's just scaled up yeah, to, yeah. to a dog version. Yeah. Um, using something like that to build the desire to chase the toy at the end is a really, really good way of building a lot of uh, toy drive. Um so things like that can be can be really really helpful. Um, also, uh, a little bit of like what Cat got me doing, Ben, on the recent workshop we attended, which is just search games. You know, throwing the toy in the grass, having the dog search for it, that kind of stuff. Um, really, all of that work should be done with an emphasis on having fun. Um, mm. Sometimes I think because people really want to have a well trained dog, they start turning it into an obedience exercise. You know, they, they add too much control. 
you know it's like uh sit stay out let go you know it's just like you, you this is supposed to be a game like like just leave the the obedience aside a second let's just really try and build the dog's drive to want to have the stuff that's a really common like beginner mistake mm-hmm. um so i think honestly if you if you're if you aren't a dog trainer and you're just trying to give yourself the best foundations with a young dog just build as much drive as you can you know with the the search games with the toys etc because then when you go to a trainer and try and get guidance it's going to be a lot easier for them to to do that you know because obedience and stuff like that is actually something that you can kind of train to a dog at any age i'm not saying you shouldn't start right from the beginning you certainly should um but from me as a as a trainer if i'm looking at a dog i would way rather have a dog with massive desire for food and toys versus a dog that knows how to stay and walk nicely on the lead etc because i know all that stuff's easy once i have the desire you know that stuff is like is not really a, a huge problem um yeah so hopefully that answers your question ben no it does it does um and i think just for the benefit of everyone listening um and maybe you can uh, drop her surname in as well because right now I'm blanking on it but can you just explain like step by step that that game you were just referencing that cat um showed us on the weekend like and 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 I guess also why again you know re-explaining why someone would want to do that and I guess what stage someone would do that yeah totally so I kind of alluded to it in the beginning of this interview but I'm I'm since listening to your podcast a lot and just kind of getting into this world I've decided to commit and and go through the truffle detection training so um that's what we're kind of alluding to here we went to see cat serafina is her name um because she's trained truffle dogs before and i've known cat for a few years now and i know that she trains to a really high level so that was the person i chose to to kind of give me some specific guidance on this um but in regards to she's the game great. sorry um, so explain pres- what, what she trains her dogs to do as well and by the way, I also vouch for Kat. I thought she was extremely impressive on the weekend. Fantastic. Yeah, Kat, um, Kat's job is uh, Japanese knotweed detection. That's what she, that's kind of her, her main source of income. So she's got the only uh, knotweed detection dogs in the world, I think she was saying. No, um, no she way. Said one other person, no. didn't she? Yeah, in one other world. person. But, but yes, yeah. Wow. I'm pretty sure she said that. I'm pretty sure. I could and be I wrong, I but she's me. certainly, <laughs> she's certainly, if she's not the only person in the world, she's one of very few. So I would imagine a, certainly single digits. Um, wow. So yeah, but Kat's got, a, Kat's got an incredible CV anyway, not just that, but just training all sorts of, of detection. Um, but in regards to the specific game, because... Um, I'm literally just starting out on my journey and I actually haven't done a lot of scent detection with my current dog uh, because we've been focused more on the uh, IGP stuff. Um, We were just starting to build some initial drive for actually the activity of searching. So this is actually, it it actually is kind of a good maybe thing to discuss because Mm. usually dog trainers split these two tasks into different things in the beginning. You have the building, the search, so what we were doing for that is I would throw one toy into long grass while she's going to find that one. I'll throw a, another toy in the other direction into long grass. So then when she brings me back that toy, I can reward her with the um, bit of tug of war or whatever gets your dog going and then send her to go and find the other one. Right. So I'm starting to build this desire to go and go and find the toy. And I think it, you kind of have to assess what your dog finds rewarding out of the game as well and then lean into that. So my dog mostly because she's a shepherd she wants to play tug so i have to kind of be make sure that the game is fun for her and then the other side of it is the indication training so interestingly pretty much unanimously now i would say i haven't really come across anyone in the high levels of the detection world that doesn't do it this way people will build up cert the like the search drive and the indication completely separately and then put them together once both are kind of strong enough to do so. Um, so so then we were doing the indication training separately. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do indication training because a lot of people like different indications. So it really depends on what your goal is with the indication as to how you go about training it. 
Yeah, as the question we were talking about, as asking Kat's opinion as well. Like, and I've asked pretty much every guest on my podcast as well. It's one of the questions. It's like for truffle hunting, what is the perfect indication? Like, I mean, you could have it do any anything, right? And and I think my reluctance to go wholeheartedly with just like a stare or a sit stare or down down stare was like, you know, this thought of oh well the scent could be coming out somewhere slightly different to where it actually is. So, you know, it's kind of nice to have a bit of a dig, but I think well, in the UK, I, I don't know, Ben, that's of an issue because they're so close to the surface. I, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I don't want to speak with any authority on this because I, I've never <laughs> like done this, you know, um, and I've never done truffle detection. So who am I to like be, have an opinion on it. However, I was listening to your <laughs> podcast. I can't, it might have been with Julie, I, I might be wrong, but you were kind of talking about that difference, you know, with the white truffles being much deeper than, than yeah. the truffles in this country. And I, I I could kind of understand that a lot more with the white truffles, how a, a digging um, indication might be m make a lot more sense, you know? It's almost um, necessary, actually. I've been, I've been privileged to have been invited twice now to go white truffle hunting with julie and her family of truffle hunters with their sort of seven or eight dogs and yeah it's it's almost a hundred percent necessary that the dog is digging and continuously trying to nose touch towards the where the truffle is because it's actually more important with white truffles oh, it's, it's a delicate balance isn't it because you want them to dig and show you where it is but also yeah and you have to get to it because there's quite a lot of soil sometimes to get through but then the challenge is those white truffles are several, well, many, many times more expensive and valuable. And you even more so want to avoid not only a dog scratch, but because they're delicate, if it's a big truffle and a dog's poor or even you're, you know, getting at, you know, it's very easy for these things to break. So I don't, I still don't know what the perfect answer is, but yeah, they are super deep. So it, it definitely helps to have a dog dig in that scenario. But yeah, I think in the UK, I'm sure I'm, I'm, to be honest, go on it's probably quite subjective. You know, I don't think yeah, that yeah. there is one right answer. I think you're pro it is like a matter of personal preference, you know? Yeah. I like, um, my friend Steph who cat also trained, um, I don't know whether cat trained this or whether it was a happy, uh, happy sort of nuanced behavior that developed afterwards, but her dog, uh, delivers the truffles to her hand. And I know, you know, digs a truffle up you know so you can be wandering through the woods and you just have a dog run to you every five minutes and drop a truffle in your hand like i think that's probably like ultimate you know premiership league level dog truffle dog um but yeah no super interesting <laughs> topic yeah it is an interesting topic i think it is a, a matter of personal preference i mean even in other kinds of detection there is always some you know, people do things differently. Some people like the down indication. Some people like the dog to sit. Some people like the dog to just just uh, freeze. We call freeze indication where the dog just stands and stares at it. You know, so um, I think it 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 changes depending on what you're using the dog for. But also, it just just does come down to personal preference. It's even in the search and rescue world. You know, like a lot of people will do different uh, indications in that. You know, some people want the dog to kind of go back and forth between them and the, the person that they found. Some people want the dog to stand and uh, bark, you know? So like, really, I, I think it's a, it's, yeah, I don't think you're going to find like the one answer to, to that question. No, I don't, I don't think so either, but I am, I am going down that route though of, of, I guess, doing the cat way, um, you know, refining buddies uh, indication, I think to, yeah, I'm happy. I don't mind if he, pause or digs and stuff but i really want to get that freeze stare a because i just love it like yeah. it was really nice watching it the other day you know yeah. dogs like sniffing like an absolute hoover on rocket you know on 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 um super drive and then suddenly just stop freeze i thought it was pretty cool um and it's also gives you cool. the opportunity to get the truffle before the dog blooming either eats it or is already off getting the next one I can say as well, I think sometimes if you, um, if you, like in other uh, forms of scent work, digging is usually really uh, disliked um, and oftentimes mm. is very easy to accidentally develop. Um, 
you know, the dog gets a little bit frustrated because you haven't rewarded quickly enough and they start trying to dig at it. And, and then, you know, before you know it, you have a real digging problem. So I think so indications are a funny one as well, because I think some it's quite a common problem for people, you know, where they've inadvertently rewarded something they don't really like and then trying to get rid of it is really hard. You know, I did that with my um, first first time I ever taught scent detection uh, was at university with my Labrador. Um, we had to do, we had to choose something to train essentially. And I, I decided to tra train him, um, for tobacco detection so that he would, in, he would, the goal was that he would find like tobacco. Um, and why, do, why tobacco? Out yeah. I actually, because it was easily available. <laughs> I couldn't really, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't take drugs into university, but that was a problem. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, so it was just easily available for me. And I thought it was kind of cool because I don't know, I just thought it was kind of interesting, you know? Um yeah. and there are there are legit tobacco detection dogs, uh, you know, for they are in use, you know, because um people don't pay the taxes on tobacco or whatever. What's it called? The duty free stuff and all that kind of stuff. So people mm. do use, do use it. Uh, it is a legit thing. Anyway, that was the problem I created in my first dog. First time I ever started doing, um, uh, scent work is I didn't put any, um, I didn't tra train any, uh, basically I just didn't really think about an indication. So then before I knew it, he was starting to dig it and then trying to stop him from digging it once I'd already, like rewarded that a little bit was really, really difficult. So I think it does help to have in mind before you've started training, what you're going to have as your indication or have the dog find something that isn't your end item. Like don't start with truffles, maybe just start with the balls, like tennis balls, something like that. So you can change it later on and your dog hasn't got a big history of digging uh, or whatever habit it is that you don't want mentioned university there and and it was one of my initial questions to to like you know just ask you how you even got into to uh dog training becoming a dog trainer but we i i went with my gut and just went straight into dog scent question mm -hmm. but it'd be great to just i haven't heard your story and it would be great just to hear i know you said you've always known that you wanted to become a dog trainer but maybe just just share with us a little bit about um you know how you got into it and yeah I've, I, to be honest with you, I I feel like I have the classic dog trainer story. Um, if you ask most pet dog trainers, they all kind of have like their own version of this story, which is I got my first Labrador puppy when I was um, 15 years old. I basically it was one of those things like most kids. I'd begged my parents for a dog for years and years and years. Finally, mm -hmm. they relented when I was 15. Mm -hmm. I got a Labrador puppy. Um, and he just, everything w went wrong, you know, uh, he, he took us ages to toilet train him. He was chewing stuff up. He, you know, pulled on the lead. Um, he did eventually develop aggression towards other dogs, which took me a while to resolve. And, but the, I guess maybe the biggest turning point for me was he almost got hit by a car and um, because he wouldn't come back to me and he was just like, he just like was doing what he wanted. So he's just walking through roads and all that kind of stuff. Actually, he was quite scared of dogs when he was young. So like a boxer jumped on him um, and he ran through the road home. And that was like the, the worst incident. Um, and then like, I just, I was just so upset, you know, I was like really, uh, just really shaken up. And I, that was kind of like a realization of, okay, I really need to try and figure this out. Um, and then I just, got into it from there. Um, you know, I just started consuming information and just kind of got hooked to be honest. Um, actually like before that point, like it, it really kind of like changed my life to be honest, because it, as like a teenage boy, but certainly I, I didn't really come from like a reading household, you know, like no one read in my house. Well, maybe my mum mm -hmm. read a little bit, but like, well, it just wasn't really that kind of house, you know? And, uh, so, but because I wanted to learn about, um, how to train my dog, I started reading books. I actually really, so I actually kind of became quite fond of reading after that. I really liked reading as well. Um, but you know, like it just, yeah, it's just something I, I got really hooked on and, and it wasn't really long after that, that it was pretty obvious to me that that's what I wanted to do. 
um, professionally. So after that point, I just pretty much chose every option I could to become a, a professional dog trainer. So I finished college, uh, sorry, I finished school. I looked for a college course that was at all relevant. There wasn't like a dog training college course. So I went and did animal management. And then from there, I went to university and, and I was looking for like a university option, which seemed most applicable. Um, and there were, there are a lot of universities that do animal behavior at the time. There were only two universities that did canine behavior and training. Um, and I'd already done a few years at Bristol zoo learning lots about giraffes and like rhinos and stuff like that. And I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love all animals, but I wanted to learn about dogs, you know? So, yeah. so I, I went and did one of the canine behavior and training degrees. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that's happened, I guess, in those years. But that was that was how I I first got started in pet dog training. Then I actually, before I finished my university course, I went over to Spain for probably like maybe about two months in total. I was working with a dog trainer that um, was quite well known at the time, but is probably even better well known now in the dog training world. His name is Nando Brown. Um, he's been on TV a lot, quite quite a bit. Um, so I worked with him for about two months and that was that even just, I mean, there was no way I was going to quit dog training anyway, but, um, that even motivated me even more because mm. I thought that, like, I thought I was quite good, you know, and I, and I went over to Spain and I realized how crap I was, <laughs> you know, like Nando doesn't what remember the this. What was the biggest difference that you saw in Nando that you, I guess, were lacking? Yeah. There was one moment, especially, uh, and Nando doesn't remember this, but it was like a really big moment for me, which Nando had this client that was very, very wealthy. Like, um, I think he was Russian as well. He was like a, like, a, like your classic, like Russian billionaire kind of deal, you know? And Nando had been, uh, like contracted, if you want to call it that to train his German shepherd. Um, and I think Nando was just kind of trying to show me like, I don't know. He was just showing me little bits and bobs and he got this dog ball and he put it on the floor and was like, Oh, Nick, see if you can train him to put his two front paws on the dog ball. So I started doing it and, and like was maybe doing it for two or three minutes, but wasn't having a lot of success, but I didn't really, I don't know. I thought an I was doing okay. Down dog ball and then, an yeah, yeah, down sorry. Dog an ball. upside down yeah, dog yeah. ball. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, sorry. yeah. Sorry. Upside down. And, but I, you know, didn't think I was doing bad or anything. Um, and then Nando <laughs> took over and did it in like 10 seconds, you know, like trained a dog to start doing it in 10 seconds or so. And I was just like, I couldn't believe it. You know, I was just, I couldn't believe what he had managed to achieve in so quickly that I, you know, I didn't, I didn't really re like in my head, I, I thought like, I didn't realize you could get that good. You know, like I didn't realize that you could, you mm. could, uh, that like that was a possibility to to be on that level um uh, so what did he do because... that you didn't do what like yeah, how well, did he do it, it so quickly in 10 yeah. seconds or if you can describe that for people listening i don't mm. know if you yeah it, to be honest with you it happens to me all the time now because um when i'm working with dog owners because when there's a style of training dogs or there's a, a an approach to training dogs called lure, lure and reward you know where you have the food lure in your hand and you're luring the dog into whatever position you want, sit down, stand, or in this case, luring them onto the food bowl. Um, and then when they do that, you reward them and you start to teach them the word. Um, and then eventually you don't need the food lure. But with lure and reward, your hand position is extremely important. And yeah. it's, it's, it's actually like a real skill. Um, and unless you've done a lot of it, you don't really know mm. where you just don't know what you don't know, you know, like it's, um, and, and it's not even something that like I would consciously even really particularly think about. It's just the, the subtlest movement in your hand makes a difference to where the dog will go. Um, you know, if you pull it a little bit more towards you, the dog is going to come forwards to you. If you put it, if you start move your hand towards a dog, the dog is going to move backwards and so on and so forth. Um, 
it's not really something that you can write down you know it's, it's something that you can only learn through just doing it hundreds and hundreds of times and your hand you'll just find that your hand just is able to manipulate the dog into whatever position you want very very quickly um so yeah it's just something that takes a lot of practice and nando had obviously had like a hell of a lot more practice than me and the funny thing is like that was like maybe like 12 13 years ago i don't something like that so yeah like we like looking back now um like nando's improved a hell of a lot since then like um i don't yeah it's just one of the you know i i think he would look back to that and think i wasn't he, he would probably think oh, i i was wasn't very good back then um but at that time he was astronomically ahead of me you know so it was just a, a moment of of massive inspiration I, I think people can go one of two ways when they experience that kind of thing some people can feel really demoralized um of like oh wow i'm really rubbish at this um but for me it was like oh wow i can like that's a possibility like i, I want to get that good you know um so that really motivated me and then i i while i was over there i taught a little bit of classes for nando and nando was like you need to go and start your own training company so when i came back to england i started um i started train doing training classes and stuff like that and yeah i've been running a business since you know doing one-to-one -one training classes etc uh it's just kind of grown over the years so yeah nice and and how did nice. the tv show come about and can you tell us about that yeah so yeah totally totally so um this will probably happen to you at some point, Ben, as well. I imagine if you keep doing your podcast, but it's um, it's interesting. I I, I mean, I've I don't know how long I've been podcasting now. Maybe five or six years, something like that. Um, so, uh, they were basically. Oh, so where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was the head of head of unscripted television at Amazon. Amazon Prime Video had an idea for a TV show. There's a there's a very big. It's not really very popular here, but in America there's a really popular show called The Amazing Race, where basically people have to race around the world and they have to complete various challenges, and whoever gets to the destination first wins. And the head of unscripted reality at, at Amazon decided that he wanted to do a similar show, but instead of it being like uh like couples or anything like that he wanted it to be like someone and their dog like so people and their dog would would race around the world doing various challenges um so they uh got a production company involved in that and uh that production company in the beginning they were just reaching out to lots of like dog experts and just i think they were trying to understand if it would be possible to be honest in the beginning um, because you have to understand the concept for the show, like was actually like on paper, it sounds insane, you know, uh, like you just thinking good about all the logistical bad. nightmares. Oh, it's just insane, but yeah, yeah, just okay, insane. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, like, like kind of a little bit impossible, you know, because yeah. you're, you're thinking, um, like, how are we going to transport these dogs around the world? You know, you have quarantine in places. How are you going to like, what challenges are you going to do with your dog? Um, like, it just seems like a logistical nightmare, you know? Um, yeah. So I remember them calling me up and it, I don't know, you just, you know what things are like, you know, you, you get things all the time where people ask you things and you just don't think it's really going to go anywhere. You know, you just like, so I, I, I didn't really think it was going to go anywhere, but, but I also didn't want to be like a negative person. I didn't want to be like, no, that's not going to work. I was like, so we were having a chat about it and it, I, I really approached it from the perspective of like, how can we get this to work? You know, like how, how can we make it work? So we were talking a lot about, you know, all of that kind of stuff and what would be possible, how we could achieve things, you know, how we could overcome various challenges that were going to come about. Um, and I guess looking back, that was kind of like a job interview without it being a job interview. So I think they asked a lot of people and then like, they just got to a point where it was like, you know, uh, they wanted me to be involved more regularly. 
um, in the development of the show initially. So they started paying me to attend meetings and kind of help them with that kind of stuff. And, and then it just, I was actually one of the first people that was employed on that show. It's kind of weird actually, because it ended up being this massive project. Um, so it just went further and further and then it ended up happening. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. then I flew over to, to LA, um, I trained the dogs, got another trainer involved called Nicole Ellis, who was local to LA. So that was really helpful. Um, but I was over there a lot as well. I spent a lot of time in LA. We train, train. So they kind of did the casting. Did you they like move there the temporarily people. or were you just going back and forth for like trips and events? Um, I didn't move the, I didn't like move there. I was, I was there like probably in LA for again, probably about two months or so, but just like okay. living in a hotel kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah, they did the casting. They brought these people from all over America with their dogs to LA. We did a bunch of training with them. Um, and then they, well, it was a bit of a joint what sort of training. Um, what sort of training did you need to do with them? Yeah. Like, well, because they had beat, these ideas yeah. for all the challenges. This is the, it was such a big project. I can't really condense it into a small story. It's kind of difficult. Yeah. But they, we, what was the most we come up with challenge so many... that you had to have to train yeah. for, or that you were so like, oh well, my god, are we really going to do this? <laughs> are you allowed? To yeah, say? yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, it's yeah, yeah. Do you Done. mean like one that like one that happened? Well, I mean, yeah, one. Well, what was the most? What would what would entertain us the most listening back to this podcast that if you could tell us about one my favorite challenge everyone probably has their own favorite challenge yeah and my personal favorite challenge was uh training the dogs to play piano um mm. that was my my favorite challenge um because basically i guess it's an artsy thing like i'm not really a, i'm it's not my world you know uh, that this kind of side of television, but one of the things that the, um, uh, series producer, I'm trying to remember the right terminology has been a little while now, um, mm. wanted to do was to tie in lots of references to film and television and stuff like that. So, um, this, and this is why it's one of my favorite challenges is because I had the idea for it, but it was, there's, there's a few different reasons, but. I don't know if you watched this film when you're growing up, Ben. Um, the film Big with Tom Hanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, Jumping about and the piano strings. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have the big piano. And I said, oh, wouldn't it be really cool to train the person and the dog to do something like to do something like that, you know? Yeah. Um, so that was where the idea came from. And they ended up tying it in. And um so we had to train the dogs to do that. And and there was a moment in the training, um, I ended up managing to get my partner to come over to help us in LA as well, because she's also a dog trainer. And we were trying to train the dogs to do it. But one of the things about competition shows is you are trying to give the contestants as little information as you can, because you don't want to give anyone like an edge or anything like that, because that's illegal, right? You can't say to one contestant, we're training your dog to play piano and not tell someone else because that's that that's not fair um, so sorry quick question and also they want do you, the, like, do you yeah. train the dogs you you train the dogs and then the the, yeah. the owner is got nothing to do with it and then the owner has to try and yeah let, no no sure what's happening here because <laughs> uh, yeah fair. yeah again because of the component competition element um yeah. it has everything has to be even so um, just for, from a legal perspective. So it was more of a case of us coaching them to do these things. Mm. Um, but we were there and present, you know, um, like actually there just showing them and, and trying to explain to them how to do things and then supervising them while they did it. Um, so anyway, they, and also a lot, they basically want to keep all the challenges like as secretive as possible. Cause you want when, when people to run in the room you want it to be surprising. You don't want to be like, you don't, you don't want them to know what's coming. So, so we're trying to train their dogs to play piano without them realizing we're training the dogs to play piano. Oh, right. <laughs> you know? right. So, so they'd made like this big strip and I think it was just like wood or something like that. And anyway, my partner Libby was trying to train, like trying to get them doing it and and she came over to me and she was like, I don't think this is going to work. Like we can get 
I, I just can't like get it working. And anyway, like we persisted and we managed to make it work. But I think that is another reason I liked it so much because it was like it was like challenging, you know. Um, but there was loads of challenges that we did, which is really crazy stuff. Like um, I'm trying to think of them all now. Uh, gosh, you know. Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, the UK, they uh, climbed up the O2 Arena. You know, they had the walkway, went up there. Um, God. I'm trying to remember I all this, it, so I've got no idea. But I will, I will go through and watch yeah, it. Yeah. I, my my partner's quite big on like you know judging films and stuff by the IMBD thing rating six point five. You know, it's pretty yeah. solid. If anything below a six, we don't, right? don't give it a time of day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, unless I'm looking at, is there it's, only been it's... one series, or has there been multiple series? So this now? was the shame. Yeah, this was the problem. So uh, it was really sad for me because it was like a once in a lifetime like crazy experience like there's mm. so many stories from that show honestly and um but sadly we literally as we were wrapping up filming it was like one of the challenges of making the show it the COVID started happening and this is oh. this is a travel show at the end of the day so we managed to finish that first series and then uh COVID happened and it just never really got going again you know i think amazon had um they Amazon also had big cutbacks at that time. Like they canceled a whole bunch of shows all at once. Um, and yeah, that was, that was the end of it, sadly. And it's a shame because for me, as just so it as could like get revived, fan, you don't, you could get the call up, I, you know, that's my dream, <laughs> but I don't think it will. I, I can't see it yeah. to be honest, but it would be amazing. Yeah. It was, it was a uh, crazy experience, honestly. So nice. Yeah. Uh, train some dogs to do some very crazy things in that time <laughs> actually so, do you know oh, what ben oh this, is a funny, yeah, yeah. this is a funny thing um at that time i wasn't at all aware of anything truffle related but one of the challenges they wanted to create make for the show yeah that in, would have been a they, good challenge we went to italy, <laughs> we went to okay, italy so and they wanted to do truffle detection really so, oh, cool um yeah, 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 yeah. So we were we were in Italy and we had to the as trainers, what we had to try and do were find ways like I can't train truffle detection and train twenty other you know, more than twenty. Like there was so much stuff we had to train, we couldn't do everything at once. So we had to cheat a little bit. And um they hate me saying that word cheat, even though it, we're very honest about it. Um we basically <laughs> used we we trained the dog scent detection on birch oil because there were so many different challenges and we could then just use that on anything. Mm. Um, so what they had made was uh, like fake truffles and then we scented those with birch oil and then we buried them. So that was like, so we weren't actually detecting truffles, but it gave the, it, like a similar experience, I guess. But they had a, an Italian guy come there who was like a legit truffle detection person. <laughs> and um, whilst he was there- To, to like consult set, and stuff or, oh yeah, nice. I think it was, to be honest with you, Ben, I think it was more of like a creative thing, like, so they could have him on camera and, you yeah, know, just like, like an old school be more... hunter. Yeah, yeah, totally. He, nice. he, he had a legato and all that kind of stuff. And But while he was there on set, he found truffles. <laughs> oh, gosh, really? <laughs> nice. Yeah, so, yeah, funny, funny thing. But yeah, that was just a funny little tie in. It was actually, you know what, actually, funnily enough, Ben, out of mm. all of the challenges we did, that was the one that went the most wrong. Um, oh, really? I, yeah, I was. I how felt did, really bad in the day. I, I felt really bad because uh, the dogs were just not finding it. And the thing is, we'd done loads of scent detection tasks, all kinds of scent detection, and, um, and we'd never had a problem. But was it because it was underground, buried? Yes. So in in hindsight, yeah. what I realized is we lot. didn't do enough buried hides. Mm. Um, and the dogs really, really struggled and the challenge went on for way longer than it, it, it should have done. Um, and it ended up being more like the owners just like digging randomly, trying to find these fake truffles as opposed to the dogs really doing what they were supposed to do. And I felt awful on that day, um, uh, because I don't know, I just feel some responsibility for the way the dogs do. Um, mm. but you know, you can't nail everything. So no. And, learning and experience that, do more buried hide 
I was going to say, it marries true to my experience and everything I've learned with truffle hunting. You know, you know, obviously you'll get dogs that just like, you know, just get it and get it super quick or get it straight away. But then for, I think for the majority, that transition between, you know, uh, above ground hides versus then going, you know, inches under the ground, you know, I think it needs to be very gradual to, to really transition that into, to the dog. At least that's what, um, so yeah, that's interesting. Um, Nick, I'm going to ask you a couple of like, pet dog training related questions like how to's mistakes and things like that. But whilst I'm going to ask that, if there's anything that you feel like I haven't asked yet, or we haven't talked about that you think would be good, then just ruminate on that. But then I'll, I'll just ask you a question um, okay. now, if I may just be like, uh, I guess just with, you know, big picture dog training, getting the best out of your dog. Um, what are the, th- and this goes wide, right? You know, to the people that just haven't got a clue we're probably speaking to now, to the people that have got some clue, uh, but just want to do right by their dog. Like what are the three or two or three most common mistakes that you see all the time when you're doing pet t- dog training classes? Um, let's put aside advanced truffle scent detection for a second, but just, just step into the world sure. of like, you know, Nick and dog training. Yeah, yeah, I'm try- I've I've got to have a little bit of a think about it. One thing immediately comes to mind. Mm. Um, I think the majority of people in a training session that aren't dog trainers don't reward frequently enough. That's probably the most mm. common problem. If you see someone that is very experienced at training, they reward very, very frequently. Um, and they train for shorter periods of time, you know, so it's a lot more quick fire, high intensity versus uh, a lot of dog owners they'll reward very infrequently and they'll try and train for really long periods of time. Uh, so then what happens is the dog either gets frustrated um, or they just start losing motivation. They start getting distracted by other things. Um, and can I ask you a so question? That's on probably that. That... Go ahead. Go ahead. So in the limited couple of puppy class type things that I've done and shadowing and all that sort of stuff, like I see that as well and I massively agree, but I wonder if, uh, What's your thoughts on whether it's like a lack of knowledge for training or whether there's like a reason why they're not treating their dogs or like, and, and can you just speak to that? Like, why should people be treating their dogs more? Mm-hmm. I know you touched on it just then, but. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think it's probably a bit of both Ben, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I think there are people, you know, it's just lack of experience and not realizing the kind of intensity that you need to be most successful. Um, but also there is like, um, there are hang ups still about rewarding, you know, a lot of people worry if I feed my dog a lot of treats, are they going to get fat? Um, I don't want my dog to be using food forever. So maybe I shouldn't be using so much food, that kind of thing. Um, uh, I think you kind of, you got to get over that a little bit, to be honest. Um, firstly with, when it comes to not relying on food a lot, um, when we train behaviors, we, let's just. Well, let's talk about uh, talking about food specifically here, because usually when you start the majority of people, when you start training new behaviors, you use food. The only reason for that is just convenience. It's just a lot quicker. You you can you can get, you know, 10 rewards into the space of time that you might only get one reward with with a toy. So it just lends itself very nicely to training new behaviors using food. But as a dog starts to improve, um, you use rewards less frequently. Um, however, even saying that oftentimes people, a very common mistake with that is to try to get rid of the rewards too quickly as well. So, I mean, there is, there's that too, but, but the end goal is not that you're rewarding with a frequency that you would when you're training new behaviors. Um, and then in regards to the, am I going to get my dog fat thing? I mean, to be honest, I just take it out of the, the dog's food, even though yeah. I just feed the dog less at dinner times, you know, so it, it's not really a, a factor. And especially if you actually have a working line dog, like if you have a proper working line dog, it's that oftentimes it's actually kind of hard to keep weight on them anyway. So it's not usually yeah. a, a consideration. John, um, that was the exact issue that I had for, for the first six months of yeah. training buddy. Obviously I was doing, you know, a bit an obsessive, probably like yourself, but um, he was on like a, you know, a, a good quality, like kibble. He's not on that anymore, but like it, he didn't eat out of a bowl for six months because I'm just doing so much kibble right. training. It was pretty much all delivered through Kong and, and just hand to mouth mm-hmm. uh, stuff. So yeah, I, I also think, and I, you know, I've got nowhere near as much experience as, as you, but I, you know, I think that's also a, a, a massive tool, isn't it? It's just like use their daily food intake for behavior 
uh, reinforcement and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, that was another thing I wanted to talk a little bit about, Ben. I think, you know, most people aren't going to do this, and this is why most people don't have really well trained dogs. If you if you want to yeah. have a really well trained dog, just train frequently. You know, um, you actually kind of like I alluded to, you don't have to train for an hour a day. Like that's really, really overkill. But if you just train for five minutes every day, you will just, your dog will be so much better behaved mm. than 99% of people's dogs. You know, if you, if you just have a training habit of doing it every day for a short period of time, it just really uh, compounds, you know, um, I think that's really, really important. And also just doing stuff on your dog walks, right? The, the things that are going to yeah, probably well, be, or should that, be then. happening every day, right? Uh, or yeah 100 percent. <laughs> because you know this is something that happens a lot in class a lot of people say my after people have been coming for a while they say my dog's really well behaved in class but when i go to the park he's a nightmare so yeah but that's because you're only training in class <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you go to the park and you just let him run around like an idiot you know like you know you're not practicing in the park so you don't get the results that you get in class and that's one of that's one of the drawbacks of classes and it's not the, the fault of the classes is just that you need to take what you're learning and practice in different environments because you're setting up the expectation there when i come to class this is how things go i'm here to learn i'm here to do this stuff when i'm in the park the expectation is i can run around with other dogs play with other dogs just you know chase squirrels and just go crazy so you know the dog has a different expectation which kind of goes into a little bit of like engagement stuff that we were talking mm. about a little bit, Ben, in terms of that's that's actually probably in in more modern years, that's probably one of the other biggest mistakes people are making because we have kind of had a journey in the dog training world through this concept of socialization. So in the past, people weren't mm. like aware of socialization at all or that that was important. Then we became like abundantly aware because there was some studies that came out that really highlighted the importance of early socialization. So then what we all rushed to do was like, okay, just get your puppy and just get them around other dogs, let them play. And just like, that's really, really important. Go mad. Um, you know, they have to meet a thousand people and you know, whatnot. But then what we're now seeing is, okay, but if we let our young dogs just play with as many dogs as they can and all that kind of stuff, what happens is we develop an expectation that that is what they do when they go to the park, et cetera. And, and we sacrifice having any kind of control of our dogs because that they're, they're expecting when they go to the park to just run around and play and not yeah. listen to people. So now there's actually a movement in the dog training world, um, which ha it goes by many different names. And I, I, I'm not really massively fond of the name because it's, it's not really like a true, um, like it's kind of like sounds like i don't know it's a bit misleading but people will talk about anti-socialization you know um which is basically teaching the dog that people and dogs and all that kind of stuff are fine but they're just to be ignored essentially you know yeah. which is more realistic um i think dogs should be capable of saying hello to other dogs and all the rest of it yeah. certainly but we don't want the dog that has to run and say hi to every single dog in the park. And realistically, that is the way that we conduct our lives. And it's the way the dogs conduct their lives if they're just left to their own devices. But we kind of build that expectation when they're young um, in the West, especially. Um, so um, losing my train of thought now. You know, like when we walk down the street, we don't say hello to every single person. You know, maybe if you live in the countryside, right? Or you just, or yeah. you just greet and you island. greet and move on, don't you? Yeah. You just greet and move on, don't you? Say morning, whatever. You just might say hi. Well, if you're in London, like, you, don't, you don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like. The point is though, you don't like run around yeah. playing tag and all that kind of stuff with just like random people, right? Um, and it's the same with dogs. Yeah. It's like, sure. Greet, greet and say hi if you want to, but every dog you see is not an opportunity to to play, right? Um, it's not that we, you never get to play, like I'll let you play with uh, like friend and fam family dogs, or yeah. once in a blue moon, if we come across a dog in the park that just is just seems like the perfect fit, then maybe we'll, we'll play. But we put that on cue, 
like we say okay or go play or yeah. whatever you want to call it right yeah. but the but the default is when there are other dogs and people around they're just kind of irrelevant like they're not relevant to you just just ignore them um like we're, we're here to play games we're here to go for a walk and just enjoy ourselves like it's uh it's not necessary for you to run and say hi to every everything with a heartbeat you know I think you're dead on with that. You know, I think that's the way that I would um, also, um, you know, describe an ideal approach. But I also think you're dead right with regards to the name being like quite like off, you know, anti-socialization just needs to be changed, doesn't it? I don't know what, what the uh, alternative yeah. was. Yeah, so, I haven't like, thought I of a good it, term for it, but it's um, but that it's just a bit of a shift in... yeah in uh, mentality when it comes to socialization. It's still important to socialize dogs. To be honest, with, with pu in our puppy classes, the way I've been doing it more recently is I say to people, when you first come to puppy classes and you have a really, really young dog, you know, maybe like, it does depend a bit on the dog's personality, but like, hmm. you know, eight to 15, 16 weeks, we're more focused on confidence building. So I'm not actually yeah. too fussed about yeah don't say hi or any of that stuff at that point, you know, we'll, we'll let them play with other dogs. We'll let them say hello to everyone. Cause I just want to build some base confidence that the world isn't a scary place, but, but once they start getting a little bit older, um, then we start focusing more on ig ignoring as a default, just, just ignore them, not really relevant, um, et cetera. There are exceptions to that. You know, we will get dogs that are super, super confident young, and with those kind of dogs, we'll go more into the ignoring people and dogs earlier, or we'll get the opposite. We'll get dogs that are really quite shy and nervous. So we'll spend more time just confidence building. I'm not really worrying about just ignoring stuff. Mm. I'm just letting them come out of their shell at their own their own pace, but I'm 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 exposing them to to dogs and people, but I'm not forcing them into the situation. I just kind of let them just let their confidence grow a little bit. Um, so you always are reading the individual dog, but generally when they're super, super young, we're just confidence building. And then once they get slightly older, we start focusing more on just ignoring. I think that's super important. I'm realizing that more and more, isn't it? You can't, there isn't ever, I mean, there generally isn't ever a one way to do anything, but certainly when you throw in the, uh, the mixture of dogs, breeds characteristics even within breeds then match that with the handler all these different factors and that you're expecting all to follow one different approach and even in cat's workshop on the weekend i found that really fascinating that she was saying you know depending on the dog you could be trying to teach something completely oppositely based on whether it was high drive or low drive type of thing um so yeah mm -hmm. i think that's uh, super super um key uh, just with regards to engagement um yeah. I know, I know you're a big, big believer in it. Like how, what, what are a couple of things that people can do? Um, either, either people, you know, every day, you know, just, just, they've just got a dog. They're not like a hardcore working dog or whatever. And then maybe another example of how you, in a different situation where you might also want to be building up your engagement. What, what can people do? Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about this, Ben, because actually just on the, on the topic, uh, you know, a lot of people that are getting this trough detection will have, um, spaniels and pointers, especially, um, you have to be quite careful about when you're raising them because the hunting side of things is extremely reinforcing They're bred to, to find that reinforcing and another big mistake people will make is they'll go to places like woods and stuff like that and they'll let them chase squirrels and 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 things like that and it seems very innocent in the beginning but then you fast mm. forward a few months and your dog is just hooked on that and trying to bring them back from that level of intensity is really really difficult so that's one thing to avoid if you have uh that's a like huge a point. working yeah. yeah totally so but in terms of just in engagement more generally um we should talk about what engagement is, first of all. Yeah. Probably the easiest way for me to explain that is through my own kind of journey with this, which is, you know, I did the kind of classic thing when I was starting out of focusing solely on the recall training, because that's what everyone always talks about. So I was always training dogs recall. And then um, I kind of like developed another, I was seeing my clients were having another issue, which is we get to the point where they had a good recall, 
but then they just were calling the dog back all the time because it kept running off you know so like it wasn't really solving the problem like yes you can get them back but you just spend the whole time just calling them you know so what i realized is a lot of the time the problem is a lot of the time the problem isn't the recall a lot of the time the problem is the dog wants to run off in the first place you know and if you have a dog that doesn't want to run off suddenly the recall is a lot less important not that i'm saying you shouldn't teach recall because you absolutely should um but maybe even more foundational than that is actually having a dog that doesn't want to run away from you or is wants like wants to stay with you um because if you have that everything else is so much easier when the dog is paying attention to you they're more responsive to to the things you ask them to do um so yeah it just makes life a, a hell of a lot easier at its core um we want to teach the dog to check in with us so when when we say check in what i'm really talking about is the dog looking back at us right so that they're, they're kind of they're actually physically checking where we are etc waiting for any kind of cue that we might give them or, or or whatever so if we don't have much engagement to start with my first step is just to reward check-ins you know when they happen if we're in a really dire state i would just reward check-ins at all you know so if the dog doesn't pay pay much attention to me the moment they turn back to me i'm going to reward that once we get a little more advanced than that and the dog's starting to pay pay more attention to us we really start to focus in on what i call automatic check-ins or auto check-ins which is an automatic check-in based on seeing something that would usually be a distraction so for example um like Screw. let's say cyclists yeah. right <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It can literally be anything. You can, it can, yeah. it can really be anything. So let's let's say deer then. When you when you see a deer, I want you to automatically check in with me, and you're going to be rewarded for that. So the way that we would do that is usually using a long line. So I'd use like a five. I like mm. a five meter line personally. Um, and I'm holding the line when the dog sees the deer. Like we have a deer park here in Bristol actually, so this is something that like we can do very easily. Um, I'd hold the line when the dog sees the deer. Initially, they're going to stare at the deer. And that's fine. I don't say anything. I don't try and like get the dog to look back at me. I just wait. And then the moment the dog disengages from staring at the deer and they turn back to me, I, I say yes, personally. Yes just means Maybe. what you've just done is won your reward. And then, and then I reward the dog, right? And then with practice over a series of weeks, we get to the point where that becomes quicker and quicker and quicker. So then the dog sees the deer and just immediately looks back at me, right? And then we start yeah. doing that with other triggers. So we do with cyclists, dogs, et cetera. And people don't realize how magic that is because then what starts to happen is when you go to the park, all of these things that would ordinarily be distractions actually become signals to the dog to pay attention to you, which is like really special because yeah, I, I can't really even describe it. It's like, you know, um, yeah, it really just gives you another level of, uh, of like off lead control with the dog. Um, and then obviously and we start to fade super out. Super important fade with uh, truffle hunting as well, like you know, because obviously there's going to be deer left, right, and centre, at least here in the UK. And uh, yeah, if you actually want to hunt some truffles and not just be chasing your dog through the woods for the afternoon, yeah, no, it's very important. Yeah, well, like the big thing with that is the first point as well. Just I would just not give them the opportunity to hunt freely. Yeah, because uh, that it is just with the dogs that we tend to you know you tend to use for truffle detection the hunting dogs that's super reinforcing you know so the more opportunity you give them to get that reinforcement of of hunting freely it just gets harder and harder to try to kind of pull them out of that void um so yeah one, it's, one thing it's i found way, useful that, that, oh sorry yeah. Yeah. that is a problem that is like so much easier to avoid than it is to solve yeah, that's exactly you know? what I was going to say. All right, so I, <laughs> somewhere along the line, learnt learnt that crucial, uh, you know, piece of advice. And you know, for anybody who has not yet got a dog or has got a very young dog, like, just don't ever let it happen. Don't let them ever chase a squirrel once. Just don't give them the opportunity or chase a deer, because yeah. as soon as you do, it's like you've just got now. We've got a shed load more work to do to like um, almost backtrack. Um, for those of you who have already got a multi year yeah. dog and you're still, you've already got that problem deep in, you know, good luck. You've got a bit more work on your hands, probably. Um, but yeah, no, super, super key. Is there people, anything else um, engagement wise that you're going to mention? 
Well, just on your point, people are in a real rush to get their dog off lead, you know. Um, mm. Again, there's like a bit of an old wives' tale of like, get the dog off lead as soon as possible. That's going to really help. Um, I, I really don't, I just don't sign up for that. I, I, I really love using a line with young dogs because mm. I can stop them from making mistakes and then getting the reward for that mistake. You know, like, as you said, if I stumble across a deer in the park and I've got the line on the puppy, they don't get the reinforcement of chasing the deer because you know, I can physically stop them. And then I can turn, not only that, I can turn it into a training opportunity because the moment they turn back to me, it's like, yes, good. You know, and we start, we've actually made it a productive thing versus if I had had the dog off lead, they've chased the deer and, you know, and now I've just got to go get the dog and there's not a lot I can do about it. Um, so I really like using a line on a young dog because mm. I can just prevent the them from developing bad habits and I can promote all the good habits. And then we start fading the line out. So usually there are three steps to that in the beginning we're holding the line then when the dog starts to we get more confidence in the dog we can drop the line so i've got something to grab if i need to um but i shouldn't need to um and then we let the dog off lead you know yeah. when we've and obviously you I... know that's dependent on the place you know it's gonna be harder yeah. to have op- yeah. good off lead control in the woods than it is like in a barren field um but you know we just that's what training's for, right? I've got a dog training yeah. question for you, for me and Buddy. Like, yeah, okay. um, I'm so I'm at the stage where, you know, I've let go of any ego about needing to have a dog off the line, off the leash, and stuff. But and he's yeah. very good, like, you know, 99 times out of 100. But for now, I'm just having him on his long, um, what's that, biurethane long line. I think it's probably about five meters as well, and he's just on that all the time. But the main reason for that is he's he's entire. So if there is a bitch, not all bitches, but some bitches, he just just mm-hmm. shuts down in terms of listening to me and will then go, you know, starts as play, but ultimately is looking to like, you know, get one up on, on the, the lady that probably smells really nice to him. But is there, I mean, I guess with, a, should I just be content with where I'm at, keep him on the long line so I can control it and probably on the, on the odd occasion just have to sprint 100 metres to track him down? Or do you think it's something I should uh, put some energy into counter conditioning, maybe even find a friendly bitch who's willing to like, you know, be the, the, the decoy or whatever? Um, how would you solve that? How, if you think I even need then? to worry about stuff. He's uh, three and three or four months, three and three months. Oh, okay. Right. So he's, yeah. Okay. No worries. Yeah. I mean, he's obviously, he's, he's an adult dog. So yeah, I mean, I will probably, mm. uh, start to do more training about around the bitches. Yeah. I mean, classes are fantastic for that then, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Because you can actually, you know, everyone's there for the same reason, you know? Yeah. Um, just starting to get, get obedience or like, you know, we went the other day to that workshop and that, like, that's another good opportunity. Your dog has to work around, around females. Um, but yeah, I mean, you see that problem a lot. And the reason I asked the age is because oftentimes like anywhere from like 12 to 18 months with males, like they're really, they've often, yeah, yeah, they get really driven for, um, looking for bitches and that that's totally normal. Um, so I wouldn't like worry about it too much, but, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's just another distraction, isn't it? You know, so it's a little bit like if you said, oh, my dog's fantastic in the park, but they can't focus in the woods. It's like, okay, well, we've got to do some training in the woods, you know? And it's the same thing with the, with the bitches. We've just got to do some training around, around them. So I, I also do need to do more training in the woods because, I mean, he's a he's a um, Vizsla across lab, so super mm-hmm. hunty. And uh, I think it's very easy to get into the realm of like, oh, I'm just, you know, doing my daily walk or, you know, and, and to drop the training. And, but the thing is, as soon as you drop the training and you get casual about it, you might have the best trained dog in the world. But if you're leaving them to their own devices, and it's 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 interesting because the whole time that they're away from you, sniffing trees, sniffing this and that, it's like it's like you standing there and giving them treats the whole time, isn't it? For actually going off and doing that, and therefore you should go and do a lot more of it. Um, so yeah, yeah I, I've I've probably been foul of uh, you know he's now three years so he's i've got to be careful when i go to some unless he's in full-blown truffle hunter mode and we're we've got you know the kit on but if it's outside of that i think i just need to do more so that's sometimes i'm a bit reluctant to go on blooming big old long dog walks because 
I'd let him get away from me a bit, if you know what I mean. And mm-hmm. I just need to rein it in. Um, yeah, I mean, we all do it. You know, we all like, you know, I'm I'm uh, raising my dog up at the moment and like, it ain't easy, you know, you make a, even when you know what you're doing, you make mistakes, um, things happen, you wish didn't happen. Like you said, maybe you come around a corner and they see a deer or something. Um, you know, like my dog at the moment is adolescent, so she's like wanting to see dogs more than I'd like, you know? So, mm. but I think when you've, uh, you know, one, this is one of the things I think that's helpful about being a pet dog trainer is because I've been through the process so many times with other people's dogs, I, I know I will see it. I'll get there. A lot of people, yeah. when they haven't gone through that process hundreds of times, they hit adolescence and they get really depressed. You know, they feel like yeah. I've done all this training and now it's all gone out the window and, and my dog started doing things I don't want them to do. And, you know, and, and they get really upset about it. Um, whereas for me, it's like, it's like, I, you know, seen this before, you know, and I know if we keep going that I'm going to come out the other end, but, but, you know, we all make mistakes with stuff. Um, so yeah, you just, it is what it is, isn't it? You know, you just train, yeah. train your way out of it. And just with regards to, um, and you know, I, I, someone told me once that the only thing that any dog trainer can agree on, any two dog trainers can agree on is the fact that the third trainer is doing it wrong. Um, yeah, yeah. with regards to like, um, you're going to ask me who's doing talk- it wrong. <laughs> well, yeah, who's doing it wrong? Name and shame, name and shame. No, but like, uh, like, because I'm still trying to figure out, you know, you know that I've gone through IMDT and all that stuff. And it's probably on like this positive end of like dog training, you know, completely non-aversives. And then obviously sure, sure. on the other hand is like, you know, whatever traditional and, you know, there's all the people in the middle, like, um, uh, well, yeah. Where do you sit within there? And, and then how did you get to there? Yeah, and totally. I mean, I um... don't know what I'm talking about. Like, can you just tee that up mm-hmm. and, and sort of, uh. Oh, okay. No worries. No worries. Well, I guess with dog training, like, uh, you know, dog training really got popular or like became like a lot of dog training came from, uh, there was a certain mindset that came from, from military dog training during the world wars. Um, and that kind of training persisted for a long time. And, and that kind of training was very harsh, you know, choke chains, and uh like heavy lead corrections no rewards and um that persisted for a long time and then probably around the 90s maybe um you started to have more of like you had an opposition to that you know uh, which was positive training which was uh this idea that you would avoid punishment essentially and you would try to work as po- as much as you can within positive reinforcement, rewarding the, the dog for the good stuff, um, essentially. Um, and, and probably since then, you've just had a constant, um, constant fighting between people that fall into either camp, you know, either they are more on the punishment perspective, or they're more on the, the reinforcement side of things. Um, but interestingly, so personally, um, when I started training, I was surrounded by people that were far more correction heavy. Um, so that was my first beginnings to dog training. Um, and then I read a book called don't shoot the dog, which was a a really, it's an older book now, but at the time for a lot of people and for Mm. a long time, even probably now for a lot of people, that book was like a game changer, you know, It, it created a lot of, um, positive dog trainers because it just really opened your eyes to a whole new perspective. Um, so for the la for the large majority of the time I've been dog training, I, that was what I would call myself, call myself positive dog trainer. Um, however, I think something really interesting has happened over the last, like, I don't know, maybe like five to 10 years, which is a lot of the people that were on that correction side of things have become a lot more sophisticated. Like it's no longer just the, like what we, people would call the yank and crank stuff, you know? It's no longer just harsh training for the sake of harsh training. It's very thoughtful, um, thoughtful use of punishment. And and the interesting thing about punishment is punishment can vary from uh, just like 
putting the dog in another and room as a timeout. Just to be clear as well, when you're saying the word punishment, are you using it in the dog training sense or the yeah. Joe Blog sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, I can't, I struggle to think in any sense that isn't the dog training sense. <laughs> so pun- okay, right. pun- punishment is, um, in, the, in the dog training world, punishment is anything that reduces the behavior. You know, so um, if I feed my dog and they and they for some reason they stop doing the thing as much, that's punishment, you know, uh, from a dog trainer's perspective. Not that you get that very often, but mm. so so punishment can vary all the way from like putting the dog in another room as a timeout, just like the the dog equivalent of a naughty step, all the way to electric collars, prong collars, um, or even more extreme, hitting the dog and stuff like that. Mm. Right, so. Um, so punishment's a bit of a loaded term because sometimes you talk about punishment and some one person might just be talking about saying no to the dog and another person might be talking about something else entirely. Mm. Um, but anyway, over the last like five, 10 years, there's it's, it's kind of interesting. I just feel like the gap between positive training and people that call themselves balanced, which is another term, like more of like a, a recent term around people that are willing to use punishment um, and the kind of punishments that they use really varies dramatically depending on the individual. But that gap between those two communities has like narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and narrowed, I feel like over the last five, 10 years. And this is just my personal perspective. I feel like we're moving away now from positive and balanced and we're getting to a place of just good dog training you know, what works, what is effective. Ethics is always difficult because different people have different ethics. Some people don't even like saying no to the dog, you know? Um, so it's really, uh, ethics is, is, a, is something which I think continues to divide people um, and you have to make your own decisions on. And that's probably something you will make your own decisions on, Ben. For me personally, I try, I, well, I don't try to avoid, I, I don't use punishments, which are what well, I, I say, I don't use punishments that are painful or like scare the dog. I'm, I'm not trying to do either of those things, but I will do timeouts and stuff like that. I will say no to the dog. Certainly I won't let, you know, I, um, sometimes people say positive, but not permissive. I'm not going to let the dog just steal things from me and all that kind of stuff. We're not, we're not going to do that. Um, does so a leash correction me, count as painful or it, scare the dog? in your book yeah i think that depends i I guess it depends on how hard and who you ask and what sort of yeah i think it depends on who you ask for sure yeah for sure yeah so but uh i've lost my train of thought now but um yeah i tried to i was gonna say i i i kind of feel like i've ditched the labels over the last few years and i just kind of do what sits right with me yeah try i try to be the best dog trainer that's how i think yeah i think that makes sense but also there's a sales angle isn't there towards saying you're one thing or the other particularly on the positive side as well you know it's like Mm. there's there's people that can easily buy into that the lead correction thing is an interesting thing because for example when i'm training recall uh if the dog isn't listening on a recall i'll oftentimes reel them in you know stuff like mm. that even like uh, sometimes on the more extreme end of the positive spectrum a lot of people don't like that don't like you physically encouraging the dog to do something like that um but for me personally i don't really see that as problematic to to reel the dog in yeah um it, it makes me think uh, of like you know if someone's 100 percent positive and they say you can't use any aversive whatsoever it's a bit mm. like you know trying to learn and go horse riding without any reins or you without using your legs, you know, cause you can't put pressure on the horse. You can't, you know, turn them left or turn them right. So we probably wouldn't yeah. have uh, ever had people that horse rode in this world. Um, yeah, don't know totally. I, I mean, made it. I think you can, anyway, as someone inter- that they're really focused on pot, well, as someone that has always, I guess, really focused on, trying to stay as reinforcement based as possible. I think you can do a hell of a lot more with reward than people think, you know, which was the whole is the whole like thing around the, the positive training movement. You yeah. know, uh, there are people that have just achieved insane things with positive training, you know, um, 
However, where it starts to lose me personally is where you can't say no to the dog. Um, yeah, I can't, like, for me, I don't see a problem with using a timeout with a dog for this uh, demand barking or anything like that. I have clients that, you know, they're small people and maybe they own a Great Dane or something like that, um, where we will use a head collar, um, which, you know, can be punishing for the dog, but is that is a tool that gives them the ability to walk the dog. You know, for some people, it's a choice between walking the dog and using uh, something like that. So, um, so again, I think I just, I, I think I, and I think people are going to more and more and more just draw their own, like, what what they're happy with um and hopefully become less and less uh part of either camp because then you just start to get this group think you know and yeah i don't find it particularly productive personally fair enough so yeah big discussion ben honestly it's kind of like uh, this is yeah. uh this is well, a big topic with me listening to your podcast there's so much that i've learned about the dog trip like you know all the rgbt mondeo like you know every time i was listening to that and you mm -hmm. were having a conversation probably with you know ivan or one of the other guys and i was just like i don't really know what the hell they're talking about right here so it's good to like a listen to more of your stuff but b also ask you these questions as well so and get your take on it um well the in here's even an interesting thing ben is like you know when i started my uh trip my podcast i was far more involved in the positive community than anything else so mm -hmm. until i restarted my podcast last year it was pretty almost entirely positive trainers Whereas now I have a mixture. I, I don't really differentiate based on whether someone's positive or balanced. I've, I focus more on, do I think they're a good dog trainer? Do I, yeah, have they, you know, have they got something interesting to say or add? So now I have a mixture of people that some people say they're balanced. Some people say they're positive, but some people will even get mad about that. You know, uh, some people don't like the, the kind of cross pollination between those two like ideologies so it's it's yeah you have to draw your own distinctions and just on your podcast um obviously i guess with more recency it's probably more of a podcast specific for dog trainers right i think i've even heard you say that more dog trains probably listening to it but like yeah. for anyone listening like a what's it called again uh and then also what sort of things or you know what's it about and then how could it help people I should one last point, Ben. Like, I'm trying yeah, not to on. elongate your podcast for too long. No, one last point. No, we're, we're, the interesting thing. The interesting thing with the scent detection world, so travel hunting included, is even the people that maybe are more on the side of using corrections and stuff like that. When it comes to scent detection, is very, very reinforcement based. You know, mm. it's it's pretty much impossible to force a dog to find something you know yeah. um so yeah so it's it's an interesting little world the scent detection world um even if you go to people that maybe in other kinds of training would use like strong punishment um that maybe you wouldn't be comfortable with when it comes to the scent detection world people are like overwhelmingly positive in their approach so so that's kind of an interesting side point but like so to, to answer your question, though, my podcast is called Dog Talk with Nick Benger. Um, primarily, I'm interviewing other dog trainers. And yeah, it we get geeky at points. So yeah, definitely is more aimed towards dog trainers. But you're welcome to come and listen. And hopefully it inspires you to in to yeah, to, to kind of get a little bit more interested in dog training. We we, we tend to cover uh, uh, just a whole range of topics, different areas of dog training as well. So you can kind of pick and choose what takes your fancy. Nice. And with Onyx, um, I know she's a shepherd cross, right? Maybe. Um, what are you? What have you? What are you currently working on? I'm guessing scent detection stuff, but you know, maybe if it's something else as well. What are you currently working on? Then also, like, what's your what's your next steps, or where are you at with regards to your scent training for the truffle hunting stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, since I did that workshop with, I'll say her full name again, Kat Serafina, for yeah. people that are looking for her, um, I've been working on the stuff Kat has given me for for the truffle hunting stuff, so that's building up search drive through just little search games, nothing that's really going to blow your mind, you know, throwing the toys in the long grass, 
rewarding her heavily for finding it. With my dog, she's far more um, play driven, or I want to, I really want to keep her in that play. Like, oh, I want to use toys more as reinforcers because it just kind of suits her more. So we're rewarding a lot more with toys. Um, and then indication training. And we're starting the indication on, on little bits of Kong um, because then if I mess it up, well, firstly, Kong is a lot cheaper than Truffle. <laughs> <laughs> but then yeah. if it, if I messed it up as well, I've messed it up on Kong. I haven't messed it up on truffles. Um, and then at the same time, we're doing our IGP training. So um, all kinds of stuff, basic, basic, a lot of like obedience stuff. We've got tracking to do. We've, we've got, to be honest with you, there's always stuff to do, you know? Um, so with the IGP so, yeah, stuff, are you, got, got are you planning to get to a point where you're going to like have a go compete and all that sort of stuff? And, and, and where oh, yeah. do you go compete? Yeah. I've got no idea about this world, but like, where, where are yeah, you yeah. thinking of going to compete? Yeah, so I mean, with IGP, how it works is, first of all, you have titles. So um, basically, they're just like levels. So you have IGP, well, you have BH, which is uh, like just a, a basic level of training, you know, um, nothing incredibly impressive. And then you have the levels. So you have like IGP one, IGP two and IGP three. Um, so IGP three is the highest level. Um, and yeah, that's where you'll see a lot of competition. So, I mean, I guess it's like any sport you have your local trials, uh, that happen at the local clubs and then bigger than that, you have national trials. Um, so, you know, we have like a national championship here in the UK and then you have the, uh, world level competitions and there are there are a number of world level competitions so there's uh, one this uh there's the fci which is kind of like um all breeds essentially uh fci is like one of the big dog organizations actually even bigger than the our national kennel club is kind of all the kennel clubs combined under the fci banner and then you have um more usually more like breed specific world championships so maybe you would have uh, the german shepherd world championship the belgian malinois world championship the rottweiler world championship etc so so those are kind of like the levels that you go through with uh igp onyx is my first igp dog so i mean um i just want to go as far as i can go i guess um and it's a lot for me to it's a whole new area of dog training for me. So it, to be honest, it was very daunting when I first started out because I'm very used to being for the longest time. Like, you know, I do my pet dog training. I've seen everything a hundred times before. I'm very much in my comfort zone. Um, I know what I'm talking about. And then I go and start training IGP and I'm training things I've never trained before. And I just feel like a real newbie in the room. Um, I was quite self-conscious about it in the beginning. Um, but with time, you just, I guess you just get over that. And, uh, it's, it's both like, um, ego destroying, but also incredible, like incredibly rewarding as like, you see yourself get better, you know, like there are things yeah. that I remember really struggling with, whereas na that now I can do without much fault, you know, like, uh, for example, some of the. Well, I say this, but probably some of the people that have trained with me probably look at me and think, bloody hell, he's still pretty crap at that. But, uh, you know, like some of the like competition heel work stuff, you know, um, there are certain skills I really struggled with with that, which now I'm starting to get the hang of. The use of the flirt pole, which I alluded to earlier in this podcast, like I hadn't used that a lot in my pet dog training, but now I'm getting quite competent with it because I've had to for training with Onyx. Um, so these are all like new skills that you just start developing when you push yourself outside your comfort zone, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you're not going to be able to really get that experience back again because once you've learned it and mastered it, like, you know, you'll struggle to go back to that level of novice again in that space. So just enjoy it while you can. Um, cool, man. Well, well, I think we've gone super, super long. So that's all good. This is going to be a really juicy one, I think, for people to, to listen to. Um, but I guess any final thoughts from you? Um, and also, um, do if you know, if anyone's, I know you're in the Bristol area, you run regular uh, classes of various sorts and things like that. Um, if there's anything else that you can um, share with people what you're up to and how they can get in touch with you, that'd be um, awesome. Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, um, I'm on social media as well. So, I mean, it's quite easy to find me. If you just search for my name, Nick Benger, 
you should be able to find me without too many problems. In terms of our local business, it is a local business. So unfortunately, we're just based in Bristol. But if you're looking for pet dog training in Bristol, you can find us. Our um, our brand is called Hound Plus. So Hound like the dog and then PLUS uh, for, for classes in Bristol. Although I appreciate that's probably quite niche. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome, man. Got any good plans for the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> for the weekend usually the weekend is uh usually is a, is for pet dog trainers the weekend is oftentimes our busiest Busy. period because we tend to work we tend to work very um anti-social hours you know we need to be available when other people are free so we run a lot of classes on our weekend so um so uh saturday so is you, usually my... just coming off the back of your your weekend then right oh yeah, exactly, exactly. So usually through the week, I have more availability. Although, to be honest, I, I do a lot of... For, I, I used to... I've been kind of dragged into doing more training recently in our company but just because of the way things have happened. So I'm doing a lot of one-to-one -one training with people at the moment with a variety of different problems, although I tend to specialize more with dogs that are aggressive to other dogs or people. So that's mm. the majority of what I see for one-to-one -one training. Um and then when it comes to classes, we do everything from puppy classes to, you know, adult classes. And then we do a lot of trick training, scent training, stuff that we're just trying to encourage people to get out and do more stuff with their dog, essentially. That's kind of the like ethos beyond, behind our company primarily is trying to get people to do stuff with their dog. Um, along the lines of what I said earlier in terms of trying to give the dog a job, right? Trying to get them... Mm. Get, I think it really adds to a dog's quality of life um to, to have something that they can do uh, whether that's scent training or or whatever it is that the dog really takes to for sure well i really look forward to uh hearing about your journey with onyx particularly on the truffle hunting side of things and i'm sure we'll stay stay connected and uh you know we'll have to exchange travel spots you know because i know you've got some eyes on some bristol locations um recently so that's awesome that's awesome man good and thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, cheers, man. Thanks for all your help, man. Well, that's it for this episode of the Truffle Forager podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd really appreciate you going and telling one of your friends or family members about it so they can enjoy it too. Help me grow the show. And if you're new to truffle dog training or you have a dog and you would like to teach them this amazing skill, this amazing fun adventure that you can do uh, and help deepen the bond with your dog and just have loads of fun, finding truffles then a really good way to get started is to head on over to my website sign up for my email newsletter and i will also be sending you um, a free pdf guide which is all about what to do before you start truffle dog training with your dog some really top tips some essential things that i've learned over the years of doing truffle dog training and speaking to many truffle dog trainers i've sort of distilled this into sort of my top 10 tips so head on over to truffleforager.com if you'd like that, pop in your name and email address, and I'll deliver that to you straight away. So without further ado, I'll see you on the next one. Take care for now. Bye-bye.